Namaste. So let's look into one of the great mysteries of yoga practice, which is pratyaharana, the withdrawal of the senses from their external objects. Very important distinction, which we'll get to in a minute. But if you go to any yoga center, I don't care where it is, even in India, you know, places like Rishikesh and stuff like that, and you start asking, well, you teach the Ashtanga yoga, right? The eight branches of yoga. Oh, yes, yes, what we teach. Oh, when are you giving a course on Pratyaharana? Uh, well, um, <laughs> we don't usually teach that. Well, they don't ever teach it. You go to any yoga center anywhere in the world, they don't even really know what it is. It's just they mouth the words, you know. Oh, yeah, we teach the Ashtanga Yoga. But they don't practice Yama Niyama. And they don't really do the Pranayama because it doesn't go deep enough. It doesn't go all the way to the consciousness. And finally, their senses remain engaged with external objects. So they don't practice Pratyahara. How can they reach the higher stages of dharana, dhyana, and samadhi? Well, they can't. Which is also why none of these yoga centers offers courses in samadhi. Because they can't pass the lower stages of directing the senses inward. Huh? Note the definition there. Therefore, they can't realize what's in there. <laughs> so this is the dilemma of the yogin. Everywhere you go, you reach or you read about these eight steps of yoga. But how do they apply? You know, how do you do it? Well, first, let's define everything properly, and then we'll talk about it, okay? Okay. Pratyaharana, that's the proper form, I looked it up, is a noun meaning drawing back, withdrawing, and in yoga, especially the senses from external objects. That implies that they are then directed towards internal objects. And that turns out to be the actual method. Let me go on. Now, in this city of Brahman, the body. There is a small palace in the shape of a white lotus. In it lies the inner akasha. That which lies therein should be sought after and understood. As large as is this akasha, so large is that akasha in the heart. Both heaven and earth are contained within it, both fire and air, both the sun and the moon, the lightning and the stars, and whatever there is in this world, and also what is not, all that is contained within it. Chandogya Upanishad 8.1.1 and 8.1.3. So then Shankaracharya writes, commenting on that, when that internal has become purified of material desire and action by the withdrawal of the organs, the yogin perceives therein Brahman, pure, appearing as the light of consciousness. So this is the light seen in good meditation, meditation based on good concentration, which is based on having a good seat, which is why you practice all the preliminaries first, so you can sit and actually do the work. And the first step of that work is pratyaharana taking the senses which are normally engaged externally and turning them and engaging them internally. How does that map to typical yoga practices? Well, let's take mantra, for example. You start out your mantra practice with a mala. Huh? I don't even have one. Oh, yeah, here's one. <laughs> I don't even use it anymore because the mantra goes internally. See, it starts externally. 
Om Bhur Bhuva Swatat Savitur Varenyam Bargo Devas Yudhi Mahi Dhyo Yona Prachodaya. Right? And then you count. I, I'm using Gayatri because this is a crystal mala, which is for the feminine deities. Anyway, once you master the external recitation of the mantra, then you have to internalize it. In other words, recite it mentally. And in the beginning, you can still use your beads like that, if that helps you focus. And then, after some time, the whole thing becomes internalized. I mean the whole thing, the sitting, the beads, the counting, the concentration, everything. Because this mantra becomes so sweet when it's recited silently. And indeed, that is the instructions, right? Well, what is silence recitation? It means that the organ of speech, which you normally use to recite a mantra aloud, then becomes disengaged from the speech organ and engaged internally in the mind. Because the organs are part of the mind and subsidiary to the mind, I mean, even to the point where they journey with the mind to the next body after death. That's described in the uh, uh, Brahma Sutra we were just going over. That means the sense organs cannot be stopped, just like the mind. Huh? The mind cannot be stopped, but it can be engaged, focused on meditation, samadhi. And that's healthy use of the mind, wholesome, nourishing use of the mind. Whereas being engaged with all these external sense objects is, you know, ultimately exhausting. That's why you have to sleep every night to recover from that contact with the senses and their objects. But when the senses are engaged internally, uh, it's like in a dream. In fact, it is exactly svapna consciousness, uh, but it's svapna being used in a good way, in a way that furthers your spiritual development. Uh, so this pratyahara then is an absolutely essential step in the development of any particular practice. Now, just recently, uh, in a recent video, the conclusion of the third pada of the fourth chapter of Brahma Sutra, we went through the Chandogya Upanishad's listing of the 22 meditation objects leading gradiently to Brahman. And I'm going to do a video on that soon, as soon as I work it all out. But let's just look at one particular example of how you would apply Pratyaharana and the other stages of the yoga practice, yoga system, to that particular object of meditation. So let's start with the first object, which is names. Yama, which means what to do, is use correct names for things. Don't use slang or incorrect names for things. That's the niyama connected with that practice. The asana is... Look up meanings of words in the dictionary. Don't just guess. Don't rely on hearsay. Go to the authority. Then the pranayama step is to pronounce the words properly. Then we get to the pratyahara stage. Pratyahara in this case means leave aside the world of names. Go into the nonverbal world. And then dharna, dhyana, and samadhi See name as a superimposition on Brahman. Then the dhyana, the meditation is, name is Brahman, which leads to the samadhi of continuous, effortless concentration and absorption on name. That's an ontological function of the mind. This is not something new that I made up. Let me show you, for example, a quote from the Buddha Suttas. On the first jhana, there is the case where a monk, quite withdrawn from sensuality, withdrawn from unskillful qualities, enters and remains in the first jhana, 
rapture and pleasure born from withdrawal, accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. He permeates and pervades, suffuses and fills this very body with the rapture and pleasure born from withdrawal. There is nothing of his entire body unpervaded by rapture and pleasure born from withdrawal. Just as if a skilled bathman or bathman's apprentice would pour bath powder into a brass basin and knead it together, sprinkling it again and again with water, so that this ball of bath powder, saturated, moisture-laden, permeated within and without, would nevertheless not drip. Even so, the monk permeates, suffuses, and fills this very body with the rapture and pleasure born of withdrawal. There is nothing of his entire body unpervaded by rapture and pleasure born from withdrawal. Samadhanga Sutta. So the Buddha also teaches this as a standard meditation, this first jhana. Huh? I mean, it's only the beginning of the eight jhanas. <laughs> but word also is just the beginning of the 22 meditation objects in Chandogya. So, if you apply these yoga stages in the same way to the other meditation objects, you wind up getting the complete result, which in the case of name is complete freedom within the sphere of things that are nameable, uh, wherein name is valid, wherein language can describe. Not bad. Yeah, I'd take that. <laughs> but we're capable of much, much more. If we can learn this fundamental, that the eight stages of the yoga system are applicable to every meditation, every type of spiritual practice, and all of them collectively and each of them individually lead to ultimate samadhi and Pure self realization. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>